everybody. I, I brought a little friend with me today. Um, I happened to find a whole bunch of crows and I'm really excited about them. They're gonna live behind me from now on. So welcome to our show tonight. We have some exciting things to talk about and I am thrilled, absolutely thrilled to have the guest guests actually for this evening. And first of all, Davey, I know has some pretty exciting things coming up too, because for once, this is this is a this is a big sort of topic to be grappling with. Yeah, I am very excited for this. And uh, honestly, I want to know just how did they remember all these stories, not just <laughs> case files, but intimate conversations and things like that. I, I'm a person who loves storytelling. And I love when people get all the details right. So I'm very excited I know. It is pretty, about it's pretty daggone exciting. And we've got a lot of cool people here. I see we've got Susan Ballinger's here tonight. We've got Leanne Close here. We've got Janine, Allison. Boy, a lot of you guys turned up. I'm super excited to see all our regulars. I'm working up through. We also have um, Joanne, who missed one of our shows, is joining us tonight. And Mike Breen's here. So lots and lots of people. I'm really excited to uh, to say hi to everybody. And I have a and fun quiz. Course, I have a fun quiz for tonight, and I want everybody to participate. And it's oh yeah, course, it's themed around the CSI shows. I'll just <gasps> give you that hint. I'll just give you that hint. So this is very exciting. You know, I love CSI anyway. Um, so to all the the book friends and peculiars and everyone who is here tonight, I want to in introduce our super cool guests. So please welcome <gasps> Judy and TJ. Yay! Hello, Brandy. Hello, Hello Davey. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to have you. Thank We're you very for now, joining us. Our, our viewers might not realize this, but you guys are living in the future. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah. They're in New Zealand. It's Friday. And it's Friday. It's Friday already in New Zealand. They have a corner on the market of Friday. <laughs> um, so is, is Friday good? Is it going to be a good day? It's oh, a beautiful day. Beautiful yeah. day. Fantastic. So there you go. There's straight predictions from the future. Um, we're really excited. You know, I have to say that I, I was reading this book and I was I was peculiarly moved. I, I wasn't expecting to be moved as much as I was by the things that you wrote. And so I'm really looking forward for us talking about working stiff, all of the things that happened to you while you were in New York, working through all these things, and also some of what you're doing now, because I know you're you're continuing on in that vein. But before we do all of that, I, I of course have to talk about our cocktail, and we have to name it and pick a winner. So thing, thing, where's my cocktail thing? Oh, oh yes, thank you. So this is I'm I'm drinking the alcoholic version, and you guys tried the non-alcoholic version. We yep. have, yes, because it okay. is also not just Friday, it's also 11 o'clock in the morning. So. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> to your to your anatomy. Mm. Mm. Well, and fine. how did that one come out for you? It's good. It's mm -hmm. a little smoky, a little spicy, but sweet. I love it. I love the combination. I love it. Um, did anyone else try? So who else has got the, oh, there's Sarah. Sarah says, Kia Ora. She, she's yeah. there with you somewhere. It's 11 o'clock. It's 11 o'clock somewhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just Someone's wanted to coming say in from that 9 a.m. So that must yeah. be yeah. Australia or Singapore. Has, any, has anyone yeah. else tried to uh, to to try the cocktail? I'm just curious if anyone else has done the day, day drinking in New Zealand. In New Zealand, yes. <laughs> um, it's Friday. It's well, all right. I, I, I was attempting a version of the Corpse Reviver, of course, yeah. because you know, um, because why not? And yeah. I, I wanted to make it a little smoky, a little bit of that honey in there just to kind of give us the New Zealand flair. Oh, and I wanted to say, oh yes, is it really? It's true Manuka yeah, honey? Yeah, it Manuka honey. It's actually kind of hard to get here in the States. Yeah. Um, I know, it's expensive here it, too. Is it really? <laughs> you guys have fancy bees. Yeah. Um, actually there's something supposedly like very healthy and beneficial about Manuka honey, I understand. Yeah, supposedly. <laughs> it's used in a lot of health, you know, uh, homeopathic, I've seen homeopathic remedies, things like that. Well, here are the names that were proposed. Okay. Um, calling in dead, <laughs> the scalpel, the galloping Giuliani. And I have to say this one, um, I told them that it was a corpse drink and also that it had a New York relationship and they thought oh. living corpse in New York and came up with Giuliani. Not surprising, really. Um, my apologies to, uh, <laughs> and didn't mean to offend. Insomniac Chill was one. Five Burrows Firewater, the Hudson Hoodoo, Cadaver yeah. Juice, 
and then we did have one suggestion, which we can't enter because they're not here with us. Uh, they didn't actually buy a ticket, but they said absinthe of malice, which I thought was quite clever. Uh, so who are our winners for the naming of the cocktail? Yeah, so we figured two winners, scalpel for the alcoholic drink, which is what you are drinking because it's sharp. And then, um, what did you? The corpse juice. Corpse juice. Corpse juice. juice. All right. Juice. That's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so yeah. all of you fun it. people, um, my winners, please be in touch. Uh, you can go ahead and self-identify here. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you're not, they're shy. They're not going to tell me who they are. Um, but we will get you, we will get you your drink, your drink. Sorry. No, well, we will also get you a drink, but we will get you your yeah. swag. And you'd think I'd already been drinking these and I haven't. Um, so we're very excited. We'll, we'll get you guys your swag and uh, thank you very much for participating. Oh, you were the scalpel. Hooray. Yay. That's awesome. I forget who did corpse juice. I, I, I saw it earlier in the week, but um, it's going to be fun. I always send swag. You get your choice of a mug or a tote, and um, I'll be in touch with you guys. So thank you for starting all of that. We will have one more winner to announce later who gets the signed copy, uh, the, the free signed copy. We also have signed copies that you can get from? Green Apple Books. In San Green Apple Books. And yes. the Unity Books if you're in New Zealand. Yes, in New Zealand, <laughs> right. Unity Books. And in Wellington, it, and Wellington has signed. I know that Wellington has signed copies. I don't know if Auckland still has signed copies. But they can arrange for it to be. They could. Yeah. And, okay. Green Apple and if you're in the U.S., Green Apple Books, everywhere. just make sure you tell them that you want a signed copy. I think there's a, a little notation space. Yeah, That's comment right. section. So if when you order it online, um, they ship anywhere in the U.S. and just put it in the comment section. And if they run out of uh, signatures or signature labels, my office manager will get it to them. So just and they ship they ship everywhere in the United States for very cheap. And that is the direct link there in the chat. So all you have to do is click that link in the chat and they'll take you directly to their book. Oh, we found, they, we found Quartz yeah, Juice. I should, I should say they also carry our uh, fiction books, uh, First Cut and Aftershock. So if you want those, they can put labels on those as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm, we're definitely going to talk about that tonight. You know, a lot of our, our uh, readers here are also aspiring writers too. And so it's really good to, uh, to talk a little bit about craft. I think it's really important. So, oh, Sarah says, <laughs> Unity Books rocks. Yes, yes, they do. And then Lizzie just came up with, she did the corpse juice. So if you yes. want to give her a Yay, Lizzie. I, I will get you your swag. You've, you've earned it. Um, so this has been, this. Is, it's just time to jump right in. And so gang, you know what to do. Your questions can kind of rock right on into the, uh, the oh, wow. When you swirl your, <laughs> that's a good question. Leanne wants to know, when you swirl your cocktail, does it spin the opposite way? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, it's, yes. Absolutely. it's a blender it's whatever the blender if, you know what if you try if, if you try it on the airplane does it change yeah. midway you know just stop and kind of go no <laughs> one one thing that i still have not gotten used to after more than a year in new zealand besides the um months being backwards yeah is the, the moon is upside down and mirror image yeah the full moon. really Yes. Oh, that's the fascinating. Constellations are different too. So it, it just throws you. I mean, mm -hmm. the fact that we're going right now into Halloween, which is not a big deal here, um, yeah. is, is a little odd because it's spring. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Well, so I suppose Christmas in July is, is a, is a, is a thing. Right. Right. Well, we're kind of used which to that. Which is fun. Christmas yeah. in July is fun. Well, we were used to Christmas in warm weather because we lived in LA for 10 oh, years. Oh, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. Well, um, the questions will start popping up in the chat. If I have missed any of them so far, because you guys have been typing all kinds of stuff, um, go ahead and re-enter it. And we'll start off with uh, with with maybe a bit of a softball question. Um, yeah, this is Mike Breen, I agree, super compelling. Um, I, I, you know, not a softball question, but basically I'm really curious, is it different being a forensic pathologist in New Zealand than it was in the US? I mean, have you noticed any big changes since you moved? Yes, I mean, it's very different. Uh, for one thing, we have a coronial system here where the coroners are attorneys, they're barristers, and they're trained in the law. While as in okay. the United States, predominantly, we have either medical examiner systems where doctors run the death investigations mm -hmm. and the office, or most of the coroner systems tend to be either administrative 
or uh, sheriff's law enforcement. Right. So it's just done on a county by county basis versus here. It's the whole, the coronial system is through the Ministry of Justice. Um, so it's just a very, very different system. And I actually really like it. I, I've gotten not just used to it, but I really appreciate mm -hmm. the advantages of having the coroners there as an intermediary uh, between us and the families and also as uh, a point person to interpret the law because so much of what we do forensic means having to do with the law and right. so having them there not only as a resource but also as the person who's guiding the entire investigative and death uh investigative process is really helpful yeah i i it's got to be but at the same time it, it does it feel sort of alien at all i mean do you ever wake up in the morning and sort of forget that that this is your life now i mean does that happen it's not been that long mm -hmm. In the, it, you know, the, the odd stuff has more to do with the fact that I, I still feel a little bit like I'm on vacation, <laughs> you know, that, that <laughs> we had kind of that mental perspective of, you know, we're going to try something new. And, and so we're still in that. I, what, what, we've been you, here do, you did have to learn how to yeah. spell some things differently. <laughs> To, oh. Yeah. So, and also the pronunciation. I mean, just talking because, to my registrar. Because registrar. New Zealand, of course, uses <laughs> uses British. British written English, right? Which is American doctors um, sometimes they don't overlap, like esophagus and fetus, right? Right. So, I mean, for example, okay. I was in the autopsy room the other day with my registrar. Registrar is what we call resident, so she's mm -hmm. a trainee, and I referred to the GE junction, and she's she says, "What's that?" I said the gastroesophageal junction, and she looked at me and rolled her eyes and says, "It's G O junction here." Because esophagus <laughs> starts with O. Yeah. Yeah. The G O. Referring it to it as the trachea instead of the trachea. <laughs> what is that word? It's like a, a whole aluminium kind of thing going exactly. on. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That's what they do say aluminium. Right. And <laughs> another big difference here is there were a lot fewer gunshot wounds. That's true. Which That's huge. were uh, any American forensic mm -hmm. pathologist sees a lot of gunshot wounds. Yeah. They don't see a lot here. In fact, part of the reason why we are here is because it's hard to train up forensic pathologists in New Zealand for a very happy reason. There aren't enough you murders. Have <laughs> like, the, the, the we have so many murders here. Go to yeah. another country to train in investigating yeah. murder yeah. Uh, or homicides. And and then a lot of the time this happens, a lot of Kiwis will, will know this uh, pattern. They don't come back to New Zealand. Because yeah. generally I see. Right, right. They go off to train and down, then you don't exactly. see them again. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, another a question here from Katie McHugh says, have you found very different attitudes towards death in your profession in New Zealand as opposed to in the United States? I, I wouldn't say so much attitudes, but there are definitely different cultural concerns because of the Māori and Pacific Islander population. Mm -hmm. um, but these cultural concerns actually are things that I'm familiar with because they're very similar to Jewish and Muslim uh, I see. perspectives on death and dying, where okay. uh, the body is sacred. You want to do as minimum as it, it, autopsies are, you know, you prefer not to do a post-mortem or an autopsy if possible. And um, if they're necessary to do the minimum that you need to do to get the diagnosis without mm -hmm. any additional or extraneous cuts, and then also returning everything to the body, which is a very I common see. practice in Judaism is also uh, common here, uh, that there is a large portion of the practice of forensics, but also even hospital pathology, where our technologists work in returning remains um, oh, or organs to family. So even, for example, if you come to the hospital here and you have your gallbladder taken out, it's not unusual for you to request that back when the pathologists oh. are done with it. So it's a big part of the hospital practice That's really for interesting. Our technologists to arrange for return of remains, whether it's a fetus or a gallbladder or an entire uh, deceased body. Wow, that's fascinating. No, I wouldn't have. I mean, I don't think. I said. I assume, like you said, it's it, there's cultural variation here, but it sounds like it's a little bit more um, ubiquitous. There is that. Is that the case? It's not just ubiquitous, but it's respected. So in okay. the United States, every the the rules pertaining to things like um, objections to autopsies, religious exemptions, things like that, mm -hmm. it's on a state by state basis. So some states have right. much more restrictive laws than others. Um, so, for example, in California, the autopsy report and um, the materials associated with the autopsy, like the death certificates, are all public records versus, I believe, if you go to Minnesota, for instance, mm -hmm. um, the 
autopsy report is not a public record. Right. Um, generally, I, I can't remember which states it is, but there are some states where there are restrictions as opposed to others. Um, in, in Florida, for instance, um, there's a lot of restrictions based on the photographs. Um, there was a, a law mm -hmm. after Dale Earnhardt died, the Dale Earnhardt oh. law that restricted uh, okay. release of autopsy photographs, except under certain conditions and only to the family, I believe. This can be very tricky, and it's a common yeah. misperception about forensic pathology that the family somehow gives permission. Mm -hmm. uh, what Judy and her colleagues do is they work on behalf of the state to take the body as a piece of property away from the family yeah. in order to right. make two determinations, cause and manner of death, right. and then return it to the family. Right. And, you know, if you let the family decide, sometimes family members kill people right. and they can get away. Well, that's true. So, <laughs> uh, uh, mm, it is, yes, it is very tricky. <laughs> Good yeah. Point. So, I mean, so it's all based in the legal side. I mean, that's why it's forensic medicine. It has to do with for mm -hmm. the forum or the public right. realm. And it also crosses over into public health as well. Um, so we are doing death investigation, not just in order to figure out whether a crime occurred, but also to find out whether there's a death that is in the public interest, which is why mm -hmm. you know, going right. back to working stiff, we focused on things like accidents. Well, even in an accident, it has implications to other people who might be sure. exposed to the same hazards. Right. Um, in a suicide, it has not just implications to the family, but to the insurance company that insures yeah. the deceased. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of interest in right. the death, not just curious interest. but And, um, and of course, so, um, in the case of epidemics and, and yeah. disease carriers and things, that's, that's important too. I love this question from Leanne because Leanne is going to get to like the, the sticking points here. Um, I agree. Uh, I was reading it thinking your hours doing so were there <laughs> in the various trailers and places that you had to go and like sit for hours with bot like how exactly do you handle like lunch, for instance, or having right. to use the No, they're the practical. I, I totally <laughs> understand that. So we, you learn when you are in medical school, even. This is even before mm -hmm. you become a pathologist. You learn to take care of uh, your own body and your own needs because you can't be helpful to anybody else. Right. I think right. even uh, Samuel Shem in House of God says, any, at a code, the first pulse you take is your own. Um, mm -hmm. so, that's, mm -hmm. so that's one of the rules of the House of God. Yeah. You have to take your own pulse and you have to take care of your needs. So it means you don't go into surgery unless you've got some food and liquid in you and you've emptied your bladder. Um, and you need to check in with your physical needs so that you don't collapse on the job. Um, right. It was much harder for me in some ways in surgery. It's You can't just scrub right. out in the middle you of You don't have to scrub in yeah. to an autopsy because you're not going to give well, any diseases to your good patient. Point. Yeah. Good point. So, so um, in most cases, most of our autopsies are done in facilities that have bathrooms right outside if we need to take a break. Um, as you know, we say in Working Stiff, they'll still be dead tomorrow. <laughs> They're not going anywhere. Um, we could take a little break and um, a, a take care of our needs. Um, it becomes much more complicated if you're going out to a death scene. Um, yeah. So then you have to, um, if they're if you're going to be there for several hours, um, yeah. Sometimes people set up uh, trailers with porta potties if we're dealing with a death mm -hmm. scene that's multiple days. But in most cases, you're just there for a short period of time. Um, you know, you go to the bathroom before you leave. <laughs> it's an excellent question though, because I can tell you, as as the stay at home dad yeah. in a family, I knew where all the bathrooms were. <laughs> you never see me live. That's true. I was like the bathroom czar. His children. Yeah. <laughs> they small bladders. Um, and I can also test yeah. that Judy gets very hungry for lunch if she's right. doing autopsies. Right. It's yeah. hard work. It's manual it's, labor. It is hard work. It, it, I imagine some cases are more hunger producing than others, perhaps. Um, <laughs> Mike Breen has a question. He, he says, has there been any reform to physician, mm. the way physicians are trained? Your experience, experience before you went to, headed to New York seemed brutal and counterproductive. And I, I actually have a little bit of input on this myself because I worked among medical students and I taught medical students. And I remember one of uh, my colleagues saying that about a third of his medical students had what he would consider to be almost like post-traumatic stress disorder from, from the job. And that they, he actually put it this way. He said, they, they get to be human when they leave. Like, like when they're done with the program, then they can go back to being human. And I was astonished by that. So yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure that it's changed. Has it? Has it? <laughs> I think there have been some positive steps in the right direction in terms of re re residency training program and registrar training programs, restricting the number of hours so that students are not abused and registrars mm -hmm. are not abused. Um, but it's a balance because you want people to have enough experience uh, doing the job. Um, and by experience, a lot of it 
depends on what comes in. You know what I mean? So if you're, right. for example, an emergency room physician or a surgeon, if mm -hmm. your hours are so restricted that you ne you're never there at night, <laughs> you're never going to see what those emergencies are like, and you're never going to know how to handle them um, when sleep deprived to some degree. But the, the, the key is to give people experience and the skill sets, but you also have to give them the tools how to deal with it. Um, yeah. You can't just throw somebody in and have them try to figure it out for themselves. Right. They need to be given the tools. Yeah. And it obviously can't cross the line to being abusive. I mean, when I was doing surgery, it was back in the bad old days where it's every other night on call. Um, we were definitely under, you know, understaffed at the time, mm -hmm. the previous year. Uh, there were six surgeons who had been hired and three had left because they were so miserable. Mm -hmm. So they didn't fill them. They just put in first year right. residents right. in second year slots and figured, okay, well, that solves the problem. It doesn't, didn't solve the problem. Yeah. Um, so there definitely are, have been some reforms mm -hmm. in uh, medical training in the United the, States. The laws have changed, whether yeah. the culture has changed. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. I don't think we can really answer yeah. that. You'd have to talk to, to talk specifically to a woman who was training right. in surgery right now. Right now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have to reach out to current medical students. And I know that COVID has changed things a lot. I mean, well, things, exactly. things I mean, were I think a little getting better and then COVID just decimated um, the healthcare uh, environment, absolutely. work environment for doctors, for nurses, for everybody. So the, it, and so the answers now will be different from where they were a year ago. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to say when, 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 if, how, when it's going to change, at least in this country. Um, I think you guys have a little bit better, better luck over there in New Zealand. By the way, Jessica Pepin says, hello. Hey, Jessica. Jessica. <laughs> um, and uh, we've got a couple more comments coming in. I actually lost track slightly um, because when they come in, they bump each other. Sorry. I saw that Catherine Ayer is here. Hello, Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Catherine's here. Hi, Catherine. Um, wow. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of questions. Okay. Back, back up, back up. Uh, oh my goodness, you guys, I lost track. Davey, you're probably gonna have to help me here. There's a lot of questions <laughs> happening. Got a question. Oh yeah, there's Catherine. Catherine saying hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> Judy, do you miss working on murders? Oh, that's a good one, uh, yeah. I think it's a good question. Mm -hmm. So I am still working on murders. First of all, you know, when you're a forensic pathologist, your work doesn't end just because you did the autopsy and wrote the report. In fact, sometimes that's when the work really begins. Um, once you write the report, it goes out to the families, it goes out to the district attorney and the police, and then subsequently somebody might get arrested and trial um, and your testimony might happen, you know, years later. So mm -hmm. when I when we moved to New Zealand, um, I actually maintained my uh, expert witness consulting press. That's what Catherine manages in uh, San Francisco. I still have cases from Alameda County and San Francisco County and all the places where I've done previous autopsies right. where they need me to come and testify sometimes years later on my own okay. cases. And I'm also available for uh, family members or uh, attorneys to consult with in cases of wrongful death. So that includes uh, medical malpractice cases. It includes uh, wrongful death, industrial accidents, motor vehicles okay. where there's lawsuits. Um, so those, those are cases that I review on a regular basis. I may not have done the autopsy, but I am asked by attorneys or representatives for the family, sometimes district attorneys, uh, to review the cases and give an expert opinion and sometimes testify in those cases, both criminal and civil. One of my complaints when we were writing Working Stiff was that Judy wasn't giving me closure on the murder <laughs> case. <laughs> like, closure. We would do these, they, she, she would have these really fascinating cases. And then I'd say, okay, so what, what happened to that, to the, to the suspect? And she'd be like, I don't know. I don't go working <laughs> around the DA's office. Yeah. They have new cases. I have new cases. Are you kidding me? So that was one of the, the joys of switching to fiction in, in right. writing the right. Jeffrey Testing book. I, it was funny that you area. mentioned that yeah. Judy's comment here that uh, you wouldn't know there was a dearth of murders in New Zealand based on the AK Acorn TV crime show set there. Yeah, um, I, I I have been watching Brokenwood and apparently there's like a murder in that town every week. I don't know how there's still people yeah, around. That, that's more representative of the actual New Zealand we all know and love. Um, just to so give you a perspective of numbers, um, there's about five point, a little over 5 million, 5.5 million, something like that, um, people in New Zealand, in the whole country. Okay. And there's roughly a 1 million New Zealanders in the diaspora outside right. the country. 
Mm, so okay. in the five or so million New Zealanders that are here, um, I have a population, I, I'm responsible for a population of about half a million, 500,000, which includes the Wellington greater area, okay? And in the past year in uh, Wellington, I've had six homicides, that's it six in one wow. year. And so that compares, I when I was in Oakland, for instance, um, mm -hmm. in Oakland one year. Oakland is 1.6 yeah. million people. And I was- Well, one, Alameda right. County. Alameda County is 1.6, but I was one of four pathologists. So again, covering approximately the same population and easily I would have about 20 homicides uh, in one year uh, for that same population. So that gives you a difference so it, homicides are a minority of what we do. I mean, they're maybe 10% of the total cases that right. we would do. They're maybe 5%, but they tend to be the, the what we call the 10% of work that take 90% of your time. So you do have to give them the extra attention and um, there's a lot more work associated with those cases. 5 million New Zealanders, that's roughly the population of Philadelphia. That's yeah, isn't that strange, strange to think about? Yeah, and this yeah. is a country that stretches from Quebec City to South Carolina. So wow. it's, it's a, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Sarah's question, how have you found getting to to grips with the cultural aspects, you know, and, and, and is, is it been hard or do you feel like you've just kind of slid right in? Uh, you know, it's so in my gut, it feels really familiar. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it has to do with that I come from Orthodox Jewish roots. Um, there are a lot of similarities in the culture, the family orientation, the um, the tangihanga, the 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 cultural aspects of the autopsy and the uh, the um, respect for the dead is something that's really imbued in Judaism. So I I grew up with that, and it seems really familiar. <laughs> um, but also just I maybe because I really it, it it, it's so important for me to identify and um, connect with the people I work with, you know, mm -hmm. and not just my colleagues, obviously, but also the families of the deceased. So right. part of my training here is learning about the traditions, uh, picking up some uh, te reo Maori. I have difficulty with the R's sometimes because Hebrew R's are uh, in the back of the throat. So I mm -hmm. have to be conscientious about doing it in the front. Um, but that's something that I just love. I love that. I mean, whenever we traveled, we always tried to absorb the cultures that we um, learned from and, and spent time with when we were younger. So this is no different. And also different. Pe people here are very, very welcoming. Oh, they yeah. really are. And nobody, are. nobody judges us harshly for being outsiders who are trying to learn right. uh, how to be New Zealanders. People are, are, are very, very kind and accommodating. That's fantastic. Um, Jasmine, Jasmine Sarah says, uh, is if a family member is, sus you know, if someone's kind of suspicious that there really was a, a little helping hand in the family um, to the death, will uh, the Emmy do a requested autopsy? It also mentions that she's an embalmer because your book inspired her. So we've got oh, a little, you, little family wow. connection here. Oh, right. wonderful. Well, thank you. I mean, thank you for the work you do for families. So first of all, we'll start with that. Thank you, Janine. And um, yeah, so this is the thing that's really hard is that um, primarily when a death is suspicious, um, it the the incident, the, the fact that it's suspicious is initially raised primarily by the next of kin. So they're the ones who will weigh in and say, hey, this doesn't make sense. I, you know, they weren't suicidal. This doesn't make sense to me. Or um, I don't know where they were last, but I'm concerned that they were with unsavory people. You know, they have friends who right. um, are not you know, taking care of themselves or maybe using drugs or something like that. So primarily the medical examiner or the police will find out that a case is suspicious from the next of kin themselves. But what happens if the next of kin are the one who killed the person? And so then it's really incumbent on a decent, uh, well-trained death investigation system to pick up on clues right. that something is awry and not just accept the story that they're being given. So ultimately, a lot of forensic death investigation has to do with that disconnect of where where the police come to a scene or the death investigators go to the scene. And if they're getting a story from the next of kin that doesn't quite match with the physical findings on the body, that's when they mm -hmm. have to blow the whistle or call me in to go right. to the scene and help guide them and tell them whether what they're seeing makes sense or not. Right. Um, I actually, I, we've had so many questions come in and, and I'm not gonna be able to get to all of them, but I did thought, I thought this was rather 
uh, funny, Sarah saying that um, if you if you wanted help, you know, <laughs> Susan would do it. I'm sorry, that does uh, not help. That does, <laughs> does not help. Okay, uh, Joanne has a question which I was going to ask you too, which is what what was your? I, I realize you had talked a lot about your father and that history. Um, at the same time, though, I feel like you kind of entered into medicine because of those reasons. But what was the you know what was that moment? What what was it that got you interested? Well, it was, it's never just a moment, right? It's usually, you know, a culmination of multiple different aspects or things in your life. And I think we touched on some of them in Working Stiff. I mean, part of it is my father dying by suicide when I was a teenager, when I was 13. So having that direct contact with death um, at a very young age and wanting to have answers so that, in that, you know, engendered a certain amount of empathy in me for people who have those experiences and need those answers. Um, and the next part I would have to say was uh, going through uh, surgery and just feeling very um, abused <laughs> to some degree yeah. mm -hmm. in that training process. So I wanted a training program that was more um, benign and and part of that was lifestyle, lifestyle. too. Yeah, yeah. because. Um, Judy, as, as you know, from, from, right. from the book, we, we moved from Los Angeles back to Boston, where I come from. I have a big Irish Italian, uh, family, lots of cousins, lots of family around. And when, when we moved them. back, awesome. um, I, I think that, that Judy saw that, um, mm -hmm. having a family life was going to be very difficult on the path that she was on. And I remember that you you thought back to when were you happy? When was in I last school? happy? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it was and it was when, when I was doing pathology when I was a post sophomore really fellow. So there's a special program in the United States. I don't know if they still have it, but it was called a post sophomore fellowship in pathology, where in the middle of medical school, typically the first two years of medical school in the United States are um, didactic. You're sitting in a lecture hall, just like college mm -hmm. or a university. You're sure. getting lectures, and it's the second two years of medical school where you're doing your rotations. You rotate in different specialties and you're kind of an apprentice and see what doctors do. And that's when you decide what you're going to go into. Um, so I took a break between the first two and the second two years and did a year in pathology. Um, that was like a gap year. And mm -hmm. it was a wonderful experience. And that was when I was exposed uh, to autopsy for the first time, not forensic autopsies, but autopsies. So thinking back, well, what's I, the difference? Right. You want to explain? Yeah. So a regular hospital based autopsy is when a person dies in the hospital, usually of natural diseases, and the doctors want to know specifically why they died, what was the terminal event. So there's no question about the cause of death. We know that it's mm -hmm. cancer or we know that it's pneumonia, but right. we want a little bit more elucidation about the final mechanisms. Um, maybe the person has like five different diseases and you wanna know which of the five finally did them in. Um, maybe right. they were treated for a disease like cancer and you wanna know whether the treatment worked or didn't work at all or partially worked. Um, so that's a hospital-based autopsy. Hospital-based autopsies used to be really, really they common in the United States. They're an important teaching tool, but the problem is you I mean, can't code for them. There's yeah. no insurance code for that procedure. Yeah. So who pays for it, yeah. right? The hospital ends up paying for it. So right. they've done fewer and fewer of them. Mm -hmm. And they've gone down as a result. Yeah. And then forensic autopsies are deaths that are sudden, violent, or unexpected, and usually in a legal setting, like at a coroner or medical examiner's office. And that's paid by the state. Yeah. So it was sure. when I went back to pathology and I did my rotation at the New York City office, which is the opening scene of working. Stuff, right. Um, so it's me on a rotation going, oh my God, this is it. That, that was my realization of like, I found the, I found the special. <laughs> I'm among my people, right? Yeah, right. No, I know. That's okay. I you two, sometimes know. These are my people. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have two, two questions kind of following on that. One, one saying, um, is it common, you know, to call someone else over like, hey, this is crazy. You need to see this. Um, and the other question which I thought was interesting is from Leanne again. Um, have you been asked to do autopsies on non-humans? Like, is that ever part of, you know, okay. of the thing? So let me do the first question first. Um, yes, we call each other over, assuming we have somebody. I'm currently where I am right now. I'm the only forensic pathologist. I have one trainee. So I've caught, of course, she's with me all the time. But yeah, if I find something really cool, we have technologists that we're training as well. So I'll call right. them over. It's not unusual for me to call up to the ICU team that took care of the patients and say, hey, come down. You need to see this. Mm -hmm. um, because there's something to be said for actually seeing it with your naked eye as mm -hmm. opposed to just in a photograph after the fact. Um, and it's usually something medical. It's not what yeah, you would it's think. Really, yeah. It's not like an ice pick sticking out of somebody's skull. <laughs> yeah. It's it's usually it's something some something, something in the anatomy that, right. that you have or to that understand. We did exploding that. teeth as our last book where people were pulling pins out of their body and swallowing glass. So it's you know, fair question. Yeah, yeah. 
So primarily, yeah, but remember that yeah. the autopsy is the most complete right. physical exam anyone will ever have. Yeah. And Judy and her colleagues see things with their naked eye that yeah. other doctors don't see. Right. I mean, like if you take, for example, somebody who has a heart attack and comes into the hospital, um, they might have you know, all the chemical signs of a heart attack and the electrocardiogram signs of the heart attack, but you can't actually see the coronary arteries unless you do an angiogram. And even then sometimes you may not see the lesion because Mm -hmm. your, the angiogram is the kind of the negative space. It's it's the, the, the hole in the vessel. If you don't have a sense of the total size of the vessel, you don't know how occluded it is that you can only see at autopsy. Um, Oh, and then for the other question about about necropsy. Yeah. So, so, um, here in New Zealand, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh. it has happened quite a few times that I get brought bones and I'm asked, are these human bones? They were doing a construction. They <laughs> yeah, found what we, looks like a mass grave. Mass grave. We were really we concerned know. about this. You know, okay. is this something? And, you know, dollars to donuts. <laughs> it is probably sheep. It's a lot of sheep. I mean, like, <laughs> I've just discovered sheep. that Kiwis eat a lot of sheep and pigs, and I've gotten a lot of bones of those remains. Um, if you but, find a mass grave and you don't call me, I'm going to be really offended. <laughs> right. and, and I even had um, a, a, a case where the police brought it in. Somebody had found something on the beach, and they thought it was a human tongue. Uh, I ended up taking a look at it. It doesn't look like any tongue I've ever seen. Uh, this is where it's social shaped. media... <laughs> Well, it was it's definitely coverage. biological. Right. So I took a photograph of it. I got permission from the coroner and the police to do this. And um, I figured it, it it smelled a little bit like marine when I sniffed it. <laughs> um, and so I, I figured, let me put that on the Twitters. And luckily, I had a marine biologist uh, consult. <laughs> Thank you, Twitter, uh, that told me that it was um, uh, a sea pickle. So not, ah, not a sea cucumber, so a sea pickle. Is That's that like a, a sea cucumber that drinks too much? What? <laughs> 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 Apparently they're common here and they can be mistaken for all sorts of human anatomy, including uh, some that is uh, not uh, as, as... Someone must have been having some mafioso fantasies yeah. if they thought they were pulling a tongue out of the, um, <laughs> the beach. Uh, this is getting to some of the questions I wanted to ask you guys about yeah. actually the writing process, not just writing nonfiction, but also writing the fiction books. And I do want to talk mm-hmm. about that too. Um, yeah. So is writing a book together like putting together Ikea furniture and how do you get through it? Yes, it is. Because with Ikea furniture, I say, here, TJ, you do it. I don't want to ah. do it. <laughs> Not exactly. Yeah, we do. We definitely lose pieces. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, the way we the way we work together is that. we have no overlapping skill right. set. Okay. So Judy has the stories and I'm one of those writers who loves to be locked in a room uh, wrestling with adjectives all day. Right. So so she comes up with these stories, hands them off to me. I start working on them yeah. and then we go back and forth. We, yeah, we used we to we used it. to do a lot. In fact, we still do a lot of work by email yeah. because she's Together. at work during the day. And also because I I'm I'm a night person and, and I I'm a morning person. can't get anything <laughs> done until about three o'clock in the afternoon. Really nothing. And I check out at around three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. you, you had a day and night shift. Yes. Yeah, we do. We run we a day do. and night shift. And with our with our two novels, with First Cut and Aftershock, both the novels are written in the first person and our protagonist is a woman. So right. I also had the great advantage of a writer of having a woman <coughs> read the entire book back to right. me as we were writing it. What would happen is we we worked on the story, we got an outline completed, and then I would work through the outline every day. And then- Not go to work. And Judy would go to work. And then while I was making dinner, she would read what I had written that day. Yeah. Okay. And, and we could hash yeah. over it. And that, it that's when I would give him my feedback. So that's when mm-hmm. I would say, oh, this dialogue, we, I need to fix that. And I would copy and paste it and email it to me. So because it's afternoon, I'm not functional. So I can read it. Was it was always cop dialogue. <laughs> yeah. Cop dialogue was hilarious <laughs> that like I would write the cop dialogue and then Judy would look at it and say, no, absolutely not. No, <laughs> no that's not how that would go. Watch too much television, yeah. right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I definitely watch too much television. Yeah. By the way, um, Sarah's killing it over here. Uh, for what's this pathology expert who uh, to my to my sea cucumber sea pickle <laughs> it's on its seventh scalpel. Um, and I'm not saying it's aliens, but it was probably sheep. Right. <laughs> um, uh, so, so I'm fascinated by this because I write fiction and nonfiction myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I am one person, however, uh, thing who delivered my cocktails and who. I hope you guys have been enjoying the videos, by the way, uh, who was a severed head in my last video, uh, Mark Skilache, my partner, um, 
he is uh, the receiving end of a lot of text that I write, fiction and nonfiction. And he patiently listens as I repeat things over and over to him. Um, but we also collaborate, but I don't think it's in anything like as, uh, you guys are really, it's not as though one of you is writing and one of you is editing. You're, you're really, but we don't, we don't, yeah, we don't, yeah, we don't step, we don't step on, on, on each other at all. Like yeah. I will, if you're a writer, you know that I will literally spend half an hour arguing with myself over whether something should be a comma or a dash. Yeah. And sometimes I just can't decide. And I ask Judy and she oh, looks yeah. at me like I'm insane. Well, I guess Catherine. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Catherine yeah. Sorry. Manager, or and, ask our daughter, Leia. Then, ask Leia. Yeah, she cares. but then also another great, uh, a, a great blessing that I have as a writer is I have no fear of the blank page. Yeah, whenever I am here and I need to get here and I don't know what's in between, I just ask Judy right. and she tells me. Right, she has a fantastic imagination and a huge depth of knowledge about her field, which is which is what we write in our fiction. Our Jesse Tesca, our protagonist, is a San Francisco medical examiner. Yeah. So then what I usually do is I throw ideas at him and or we go for a little walk and we discuss what's going to happen next in the book. And at some point he says to me, OK, stop talking. I need to go right now. <laughs> um, Wait, but I definitely I mean, I definitely do some of the writing myself. Um, sure. Or editing. Um, but specifically, the writing that I will do will tend to be focused on uh, things that are mm -hmm. professional. So, for example, TJ will write. Um, insert autopsy findings here <laughs> and, then he to me, and I will write the part about what she sees yeah. in the autopsy yeah. um, mm -hmm. or um, he'll write some dialogue and I will rewrite it uh, based on what I, you know, the ear that I've picked up of how courtroom cops, scenes too. We, yeah, we, we always, speak. we almost always have a courtroom scene in, yeah. in our books and uh, those are almost verbatim. Yeah. Judy's, Judy's been in okay. court a lot as an expert. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you know, it, it doesn't, I mean, you wouldn't think that courtroom scenes would be, you don't see very many actually in 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 like say televised fiction and so it's really interesting to see them and see them well done um we have a question here about what would you say was your most memorable case and i want to put a spin on it what's your most memorable case in nonfiction and also in fiction together what do, what, do, what do you like the best okay so well, let me let me can i can i tell you about the the, the fictional one first? yeah you did i think my my favorite case in the <laughs> fictional one actually overlaps mm -hmm. because the very first death in our novels is a character who is based on an actual investigation that Judy did mm -hmm. of Lumpy Chen. And, yeah. and so that's uh, in first cut. That's in, that's the first death in first cut. Yeah. Yeah. First so, death in first so cut. That was the okay. case. So that that crossed over from non. But and and we should say that in all of our fiction, we try we try to borrow from so usually multiple cases, like details mm -hmm. from multiple cases to put it together. Um, that case, um, one of the most common crimes in San Francisco, besides uh, cell phone theft is a uh, laptop theft. People will sit okay. in a cafe and work on their laptop and then somebody will come by and grab the laptop and run. This happened to a, a fellow yeah. stay-at-home dad buddy of mine in a, yeah. in a cafe. He was just sitting there working and some guy said, hey, he looks up and zoink, just grabs the laptop <laughs> and run. So they're one of those cases ended up on my table because the guy who stole the laptop didn't realize that the victim of the crime had a gun and started shooting up the cafe. Oh. Everybody ducked. Um, it was some of this was caught on video, not all of it, but um, eventually the shooter shot the the thief and then he didn't just shoot the thief. In, he affirmatively yeah, murdered the thief. Like the guy was already down, yeah. and he shot him to kill him. And then he grabbed the, the his own laptop and walked out of the cafe as if walked. He just walked. Wow. Um, and so I was called to the scene by the police in order to answer the routine questions of, uh, you know, how many gunshots? Um, is it compatible with what the witnesses are saying? What was the range of fire? These are the kind of questions I get asked. And I, you know, you're standing around there for a while. And all I could think of was what was on that laptop that was so important that you would kill somebody over. Yeah. And that's the that one right there is the yeah. seed for a detective novel. That was yeah, the what it that's that prompted. You take it from it. there and see where it goes. Yeah. So this is the thing is that I never really found out in the real case what was on the laptop, but that's where fiction comes. Right. In. Yeah. <laughs> that's one of those cases where so, I came back to Judy and said, "What, what was on the laptop?" And I go, "I don't know." Uh, but maybe let's the guy pled out because if the guy pleads yeah. out, if it never, if it never, if the district right. attorney never brings it before a grand jury, then, then Judy if, never finds out, or if the police never catch it. You right. know, that happens right. If he he walks off with nobody. I love exactly. that's fascinating. I think that's, that's when you were also really hungry, remember? Because it was a gelatarium. It was a gelatarium. <laughs> Between what was on that so was laptop, late at night, I was like, would it be appropriate for me to ask for some gelato? <laughs> but no, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> Just, 
What about your nonfiction? Well, story? you know what? I, I feel like this is a good segue to yeah, sure. to to Davies to Davies portion of our of our show today. But before we do that, I just want to give our winner. Um, we always pick a winner randomly for a signed copy of a book. And today, I hope you're with us. It's Paige Turner, and I I is is Paige oh, Turner God. here? I'm not sure what your username is on the actual. Uh, on the actual device, but you are winning a, say, a signed copy and I will be letting you know shortly um, via email. So congratulations to you. Davey, take it away. All right, well, actually I was gonna kind of continue on this thread because in doing a little research beforehand, I've noticed that you, both of you have kind of had your hands in the fictional world, the TV world, the movie world, maybe a little bit. So. Can you tell us some of those connections? Where may we have seen your work or your hands or your influence on some things? Uh, well, I actually got called a long time ago to be a consultant on ER because they had an autopsy. Remember that? So when we lived in yeah, Los Angeles. Judy, Judy, went to, Judy went to UCLA Medical School and Residency, and I worked in the film industry while we were there. So we lived there for about 10 yeah. years. Yeah. And then if you go to our website, which is drworkingstiff.com, I believe we have uh, media links there for some of the things that we are currently doing or have done recently. Um, so that includes, I've had interviews on Inside Edition, I've spoken on CNN, um, we've got links to writing that we've done. We, we both, I, it's under my byline, but we write it together. It's a column for med page today. So mm -hmm. it's, even though it's primarily geared toward physicians, um, they have, there are some excellent essays in general in med page and I do recommend it for the public because it's written for uh, you know a more ge general audience. Yeah, if you're interested in what, what Judy is, is doing yeah. today and what's sort going through her head, that, that column is a really good place to go. It's one of those one of those websites where you do have to register with an email. It doesn't cost right. anything. There's the no email place. doesn't have to be your regular usual email, <laughs> but MedPage but today yeah, med and page then look today. for uh, the column Working Stiff. Or you could just Google it, Working Stiff MedPage today, right. Melanek, my name. But ER, ER, you made, you made the... Um, the makeup people go go know, back with the corpse. They did you? that. They, yeah. So that I had gone out to. I was actually at the uh, the, um, the studio. The studio it was Sony. I think. And was and you actually brought. Did you bring Danny? No, he wasn't born yet. No, I just came no, along. For I the just remember nursing. Oh, maybe I did. I remember nursing. That's him on right. That set. That's right. Our baby <laughs> Daniel. Daniel was an infant, and, and I brought nurse. him along. You and did. You nursing him there. Well, there's a fun yeah. field trip. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of a fun backstory. But um, yeah, they had they had made the cut. They made a makeup incision on the head looking like this around the forehead and as anyone who works in forensics or um in the funeral industry knows you don't do anything where it's going to be visible incisions are actually made over the top of the head in the hairline um so that it can be hidden either by the hair or in the case of somebody who's and then bald, the scalp is pulled back by the pillow yeah so so the makeup incision and it was an actual living person playing okay, the dead yeah, body it was yeah. not a mannequin so he had to go back into the makeup uh uh, trailer and get that redone. Do you elbow TJ during movies and go, that's a good dead body? That's it's worse. I can't even watch them. I throw things at the television. I once ruined it. We were almost thrown out, of, yeah. thrown out of a movie once because it was, <laughs> which oh, one it was, was Black, one. Black Mass, which is the story is of uh, yeah, Whitey Bulger in, in, in <laughs> right. Boston. Having grown up in Boston, uh, I already found, we've watched this movie in San Francisco with right. some other Boston townies. And already there were some things that were funny just because anytime you watch a movie <laughs> about your hometown, it's never sure. right. You know, yeah. the car the chases go in the wrong, wrong The accents so are hilarious. Were, but yeah. there's a scene where a character is just absolutely brutally murdered three different ways, like, like long range gunshot wound, close range gunshot wound, and he's beaten with a bat. And when this is over, it's a really horrible scene and it's a likable <laughs> character. And there's a hush over the audience and everyone's about to throw up. And Judy says to me, I just whispered to him. I said, that's a three day autopsy for somebody. And he started lost it. up. Completely and then everybody in the movie it. theater was looking at us like, what is wrong is with this these psycho? <laughs> And she wasn't and trying was, to be funny. She wasn't trying to she be wasn't. funny. She wasn't. That was, was honestly like, like her take. But no, when I, I saw that, the, you know, the distant gunshot wound, intermediate, close range beating, I was like, oh, God, that's a lot of work. <laughs> because I'm always thinking in reverse about what, what you're going to see on the body. Yeah, she ruins TV shows for me, too. Like at one time I was folding laundry. She comes in. I'm watching one of these British mysteries. She watches it for three minutes and says, oh, that's strychnine. <laughs> and then I left. And he's like, what? What did you just do? And I was right. I was 20 so minutes excited. later at the end of the, guess what? <laughs> Excellent. Well, speaking of those TV shows, so the quiz today is about the TV show CSI. Now, I don't know if you're fans yeah. or not. Clearly, Brandy is a big fan. I was actually more of a fan of the show of Bones, personally. Okay. But 
I love that drama, uh, that interpersonal will they, won't they? But uh, I'm going <laughs> to ask you about CSI, and it's a very simple quiz. You're just going to have to answer, is it CSI New York, CSI okay. Miami, or CSI Vegas? So I'm going to give you sort of the synopsis, and you let me know where you think. And Peculiars, our fans, I want them all to chime in and let me know what they think. So well, we're going to give them a chance to answer. Yeah, absolutely. So the first question, again, New York City, Miami, or Vegas. In this CSI episode, a large yacht slams into a bridge, maybe eliminating one of the three options here. But the team <laughs> finds the man steering the boat was shot and killed before the accident. It's discovered that it was a dad trying to pay his kidnapped son's ransom with fake jewels. So a very intense Miami. episode. If it's a yacht, it's Miami. Yeah. What are the reminds me of Miami like? Vice? Do, 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 do. Yeah, yes. they're filling out Miami here. We're going. We're going with Miami on that one. All right. And the answer, it was. It was CSI Miami. All right. The episode was titled "Lost Son," season three, episode one. They kicked off. Did you have cases like that where it was or, kind of wrapped up to look like an? I, you kind of had some of those in the book, didn't you? Where they were yes, made we to look did. like an we accident. Yes, we did. We covered some of those in our in our fiction. But I do want to mention with regards to well, we can't to tell CSI, you about our fiction because that would yeah. be spoilers. But in our nonfiction, yeah. working stuff, there are cases. Like yeah. that. There are cases about that. But more more important, I just want to comment if anybody is a fan of CSI, uh, you can Google just the phrase seven CSI fails." <laughs> and we have an essay that we've written both on our blog and it's been re reprinted in a bunch of other places about the seven things that drive us crazy yeah. about television shows like CSI. Is there as much will they, won't they in the real medical examiner's office? Or you didn't absolutely not. That's one of the items. Oh, that's one yeah. of the things. Yeah. You so, didn't yeah, have one story have... of uh, you did have one story with the firefighter, and uh, I think right, and and one of yeah. the team members. Uh, that was a cop, though. It was a cop. It was a cop. Member. Okay. Yeah, but but it was it's um, I think it was a cop, wasn't it? Yeah, but it the the problem with. Uh, having romances with right. other sworn court officers right. is that yes. um, then there can be, you can screw up the entire case that right. way. You know? So yeah. that's the thing. You don't want to be put in a situation where there are any allegations that you've had a romance, for instance, with a police officer or one of the death investigators, because then that's going to get, uh, used in court against you basically um so you want just like any professional relationship i mean any job you really want to keep your romances out of the workplace um all the more so in uh a forensic much more case. so if there's lawyers involved right yes. exactly yes well all right we'll <laughs> save it for hollywood yeah we'll save it. all right question two of three um in this csi episode a failed bank robbery leads to a hostage situation and the csi team must prove that the bank robber did not kill the bank manager who was found in a pool of blood in the vault. So a very complicated episode. They were actually a hostage in this. Okay. Um, well, I don't, I, I mean, the question is, where do we think they're more likely to have vaults? That sounds like Vegas, Vegas to me. I'm going to go with Vegas. We're going right. to vote for Vegas. On what that are they saying in the chat here? Um, <laughs> someone joked that the CSI Las Vegas, the yacht gave it away. <laughs> uh vegas all right let's see what the answer was nope this was actually new york city new york. okay new york. there are banks there are banks but i don't know about yeah. vault vault <laughs> is kind of more this was yeah. season four episode 21 <laughs> for those of you who are big fans all right and our final question here and uh in this csi episode they must reinvestigate one of their earliest cases for a retrial with the murder claim murderer murderer sorry claiming to have been wrongly convicted the original case and brandy's been covering it up with the banner here brandy you got to clear the banner so i can read it <laughs> the original <laughs> case involves a man dead in his living room with blunt force trauma to the head and a rock used to break the window which one do you well, think well i think csi started out as a las vegas the first show was las vegas wasn't it yeah, so let's. You want to go with Vegas again? Let's do the. Let, let's go with Vegas since you the last one was New York. All right, so what are they saying here? Yep, New York. Tori thinks New York. Uh, probably, I'm probably uh, wrong. All right, we're going for the answer. Don't, don't it is work. Vegas. It <laughs> is <laughs> Vegas. Uh, the episode was titled "If I Had a Hammer," season nine, episode twenty-one. Did you ever have any 
uh, situations with retrials like that where you had to dig out all the notes? And I know you said yeah, you so saved I, a lot I of the tissues I actually do have – so I get – in my medical legal consulting practice, it's not unusual for me to be asked to review cold cases or cases on appeal where people have been tried. Um, or cases where it's gone through the criminal courts and now right, it's going through a civil, civil. Um, procedure. Yeah. So it's not unusual for me to try to do a little bit more investigation or get additional information that wasn't available in the first trial. That's something I routinely ask about, actually. Have we ever set someone free? Have we ever had a situation like that yes. where the yeah oh yeah yeah so yeah. I work also uh, pro bono for the Innocence Project and and, and shout out to the Northern California Innocence Project and I, I highly recommend uh, the work that they do um, to try to uh, free people who have been wrongfully convicted. But I've I've been involved in several exonerations as a result, um, either due to inadequate autopsies done initially or just testimony that was um, in error because the science had changed or because the facts of the case had changed, influencing um, what the outcome would be. Oh, excellent. There, So there are some happy stories that come out of, of all oh, this. Yeah. Sometimes. No, yeah. One of the good things I value so much, and we actually riffed off of it in First Cut, is I have um, uh, framed in my office, <laughs> Catherine will tell you, um, uh, a letter I got, which is a not guilty verdict uh, on a criminal case I was involved in, um, basically signed by the attorney and the defendant and his mom, I believe as yeah. well, saying, um, don't let anyone ever tell you, you you don't save lives. And that meant so much to me. I framed it and put it in my mm -hmm. office. That's so wonderful. we we borrowed some of that in one of our uh, fictional books, but the letter was written to somebody else, not to the pathologist. Well, thank you. Thanks for sharing. That was super great. I, I feel all kind of like, oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. we don't normally get that, that, that sort of feeling mm -hmm. out, out of, you know, like death and corpses <laughs> normally. <laughs> it, it, it is. I mean, I get that feeling all the time. I got to say, I mean, that's one of the things about, working closely with death and anybody who works with death, whether it's in hospice care or in the funeral industry um, knows it, is that it's an incredibly life affirming. Like everybody assumes mm -hmm. that it would be depressing or sad, but it's actually the opposite. It makes you appreciate life more. It makes you value every single moment you have with your loved ones, with your kids, with your family. Just you wake up every day and appreciate that you're alive. And that's a pretty and, good and thing. And also remember that Judy is in a privileged position where mm -hmm. there's been a death and she's not the poor cop who has That's to right. go ring the doorbell of the next of kin and tell them that their son is dead. Yeah. And she's not the social worker, like my sister-in-law mm -hmm. is, who would work with that family for months afterwards to help them get over their grief. When they come to Judy, they have concrete questions right. and she yeah. has the answers to them. Sometimes, not always, yeah. but I try. I mean, at least I can I can make an effort. And I think that I'm in a, in a privileged situation that way, that I'm there to help them give them some sort of closure or move along in their grief. I may not solve the problem. I'm not, I can't undo what was done to the decedent, right. but helping them understand what happened yeah. and helping them uh, get closure is a really important part of the grieving process. I think that's wonderful. I, I you know, I feel, so I'm a, I'm a writer, I read texts, um, but in some ways I feel like you, you both read the text of the body and then you write from the body. And so, I mean, it, it's really interesting back to this concept of the partnership of writing from fact to fiction and, and back again, you have interesting roles um, with Judy reading the body and translating that into text and TJ taking the text and translating that into fiction. I think it's, it's, it's pretty impressive uh, what it is that you do. And I, I agree. I think it's really something and not, not something everyone can do. Not easy at all. I mean, I mostly, I also uh, generally work with dead bodies in the sense that I don't tend to write about now. I write about the past. I'm a historian. <laughs> and that's easier because they're quieter and, and less likely yeah. to sue you. <laughs> they can't complain. Um, <laughs> yeah. I used to, I lived in an underground house next to a cemetery. I've told my, the peculiars know this about me. Um, and they make quiet neighbors. And that's, that's, that is very right. Weird. Uh, but um, I, I think that you're still you're constructing something out of out of details, and all writers are stitching things together too. And um, it's a I just find it very interesting how you translate. When I write fiction versus my nonfiction, I feel like I'm in two different head spaces. But for you, it mm -hmm. almost seems like there's a real seamless um, connection to be to be made there, and I that's really really interesting. I think. 
we're very lucky to have it. Yeah. yeah. We're, no, I mean, we feel very lucky. And it's it's partially because, you know, our kids are older now. They're, they're, they're busy with their own lives. So but that's another an thing that, that's another thing that to, gives us, right, exactly. Yeah. It, 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 working together, especially when the kids were younger, it gave us something else to talk about besides, besides the kids <laughs> and the horrible things that Judy does at work. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, yeah, and we, we've been working together. So we so we're practically high school sweethearts. We met Aww, freshman 18. year of college when we yeah. were 18 years old, started dating when we were 19 years old. And back then we worked as a creative team on stage where I was a director and Judy was a producer for, for student theater. Yeah. And we worked together really seamlessly back then, too. So we just we if we're one of those married one of those couples pairs that works to practice. Well. In that way, you know, parenting yeah. is also that too. That's also I mean, true. Yeah, yeah, good parenting. You have to be able to tag team as well. Here, you take it. <laughs> I can't deal with it anymore. Did, you know, so did that's, the that's kids? Kind of did the kids end up leaning into science or writing or the arts, or did they go their they're own complete artists. way? Sadly, they're all artists. They're all yeah. artists. <laughs> Not a single doctor among the four. <laughs> But luckily, I have many proteges. Jordan, I'm thinking of you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we have I have a lot of students, um, you know, uh, who have come through the years mm -hmm. and who have taught pathology either as medical students or some of them are um, undergraduates who have shadowed me over the years. And I love them all. And you're all my children. Yeah, baby, so. <laughs> baby Danny from the book, who is yeah. sort of the comic relief toddler in the book, is now 21 years old. Yeah. He is a college student at the University of California. And He's a Barbara. musical genius. I'm not just oh, wow. a bragging dad he has he has perfect pitch and he's one of those people who is just naturally a musical genius so he is a music composition major with a minor political. in political theory um yep. so he wants to now he sort of wants to go wants into to politics political. which is great we're very proud of him and he's he's doing great I and um it. our other kids are their writers and their artists and they're, uh, they're singing oh they're and great dancing. singers yeah dancing yeah. singing yeah. <laughs> they, they love the performing arts but sciences nope not so not much but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, th I think it's really wonderful. And I, I, I really want to thank you because uh, the other thing that was really interesting, and then we're running out of time, so I can't, I, I can't power through to, there's so much to talk about, but um, I was quite impacted by what you had to say about September 11th, because I was in a tall building in Cleveland, Ohio. I was on the 51st floor of a tall building, the tallest building in Cleveland, Ohio on the day that it happened. And at first they evacuated us thinking that the fourth missing plane was coming for us. And because it was just us and, and the Sears Tower in Chicago. So it was one of them, they thought. Oh, yeah. And so um, that was really, I hadn't relived that. I hadn't really thought about that in a long time. And I, I was in a tall building watching tall building fall on television while standing in a tall building. And it was uh, uh, very strange. But we had 200 people with us that day for a limited partners meeting from New York. And they were all usually in the Twin Towers. <sighs> so, so, so them being people, there probably saved their lives. Saved their actual. lives yeah. But imagine yeah. their feelings. I mean, the, the the stress. We couldn't get them home because all the, there were no flights. Oh, so, it was. Yeah. You know, this anniversary, this, this 20 year was, year a, hard was a really yeah. hard one for me. I mean, both of us, um, you know, the, one of the reasons why it took us so long to write Working Stiff, there was about a 10 year gap between I, when the events actually happened and I, you know, wrote the notes of, that became the book. And when we finally got a book deal and got it published. And the happy, was, the happy reason yeah, was because we were busy, Judy we handed me this rough material and said, OK, you're a writer now. Right. And we had a brand new baby. And I was like, OK, great. I'm a stay at home dad. I'll park the baby in the corner and I'll just write it. <laughs> Right? Yeah. yeah. So ten years work. later, <laughs> then they're in school, and then you can out. write. But, but the other reason it, was yeah. emotional. Yeah, the biggest, the big reason was we just couldn't tackle the 9-11 stuff. Uh, we needed some distance with time. And to be honest, um, the ten-year anniversary of uh, the 9-11 uh, uh, terrorist attacks. Went, All of a sudden, it didn't. It didn't seem like history, yeah. personal history anymore. It seemed like history. Yeah. And and our kids were learning it in school, yeah. like it was right. history. So we realized it's really important for us to write this, um, and that's why we ended up uh, writing it. It's yeah. the, it, but we we also didn't want it to be a nine eleven book. I mean, ultimately, right. we it was very important for us to really give a portrayal of what forensic pathology is, the kind of nuts and bolts of what it's like to do a natural death or an accident or a suicide. But we couldn't ignore nine eleven either because it was such a huge part of my right. training. Um, but it, we thought it was appropriate to cover it actually towards the end, even though it happened at the beginning of my training. That was the editor's um, idea. Yeah, that was Shannon was Welsh's brilliant. idea. I, I, I think it worked really well. It, it gave us a chance to get to know what right. the job was prior to, to, to that occurring. And I think that was important yeah. in many ways. And, so and, and it is. 
is because that's the thing is the 9-11 is, is a totally different ballpark. You know, you have to have an understanding of what it takes to right. identify somebody, what it takes to do a, a blunt trauma autopsy, a homicide autopsy before you can tackle a mass fatality incident like 9-11 from, a, from an academic standpoint, even when you're teaching someone about it. Um, and but I yeah, this anniversary was tough for us. We usually shut off the radio oh, yeah, about, for about okay, 24 yeah. hours and uh, just to kind of mentally reset ourselves because it's it's too emotional. Um, but you know, all of us are connected that way. All of us, the whole uh, everybody who worked uh, on the pile, you know, all of the medical examiners who were there on the New York City office, the the uh, police department, the fire department, we're all you know just blood brothers, so to speak, um, yeah. having having lived through that experience um, two decades ago. I, I did think you did a good job of structuring the book like that and kind of setting the reader up to know that's where we're kind of heading, where we're kind of ending. Because every time you mentioned a date, I was like, okay, summer of 2001, I, right. I know where we're going. Yeah. Um, so it kind of did ease us into that. And I think you you were so open and honest and detailed in that section that I, I think that's part of the reason probably why the chat isn't filled with 9-11 questions because yeah. you, you just did such an amazing job of Mm -hmm. telling that story. If you're going to do something like that, you can't pull any punches. Right. Yeah. And, and you yeah. have to be honest about the fact that it's not, you know, there's no, there's no glory in it. You know what I mean? It's like, you're, you're just doing your job, but more importantly, it's a team effort. Uh, yeah. I was the least experienced person there. I had July and I came in July. I had July and August of experience right. before September 11th happened. So really none of us could have done it if it wasn't for the cohesive abilities, you know, of the, of Dr. Hirsch, the chief medical examiner, Dr. Flomenbaum, the deputy, deputy chief, and all of the agencies that just came together to support us during that time, you know, the Port Authority, the police department. And that's um, what, what makes me gratified now 20 years out is I know that there are people who read Working Stiff yeah. who have no experience of 9-11, don't even know what it is apart from, oh yeah, it was a bad thing that happened. And I hope that this gives them more of an idea of what it actually meant to the city of New York mm -hmm. and to all those people who, who worked at it. I think the idea that they're, sorry, Bart, uh, is a little bit of a mascot for the um, peculiars, and he, he's Beautiful. decided that I have I have not been paying nearly enough attention to him. So I'm sorry for him appearing out of nowhere. It's fine. It was that, or have him yowling while you were talking. Right. Well, <laughs> luckily, Winston's been quiet. We have a, we have a small Chihuahua <laughs> wire terrier mix here somewhere. Bart is Bart is 15, and he can be extraordinarily more. persistent and loud when he really wants to be. Um, this has been so much fun having you guys on and I think enlightening. I think everybody's really enjoyed it. And I know we have to get wrapped up to say goodbye here. We've already gone over time a tiny bit. Um, I, well, I totally agree. Bart, Bart is awesome. Um, but uh, I had a couple of announcements I want to give you guys. So just don't leave just yet. Um, briefly, there's some big news coming for you because we are getting ready to launch our second season. Yeah, we're going to have a second season. Um, it, I can't believe that this has done so well. And we have a lot of great authors coming up. And you will have a chance to subscribe in the future to the season. Rather than doing them piecemeal, you can get one, get it out of the way all in one, one go. It helps support us. And in addition, uh, you'll get some extra things, some swag. We're also moving our store. So soon there will be, um, I couldn't get enough quality control using Zazzle. So I will, I will soon be my own shop and you guys will have much uh, more things to choose from and lots of exciting gear coming your way. We've partnered with those bookstores so everybody can get all of these uh, fantastic signed books. And that's really exciting. Um, and this is true for all of our events going forward. So you can have books that are signed. And I think it's super exciting um, that you, you know, to, to hold in your hand something that's, that's actually has the signature of the author always means a lot to me. Um, mm -hmm. Don't forget our upcoming events. October is going to be kind of Kind of big. Um, you might want to follow me on TikTok. I, I get weirder. Uh, <laughs> I know it seems like that shouldn't be possible, but it's true. So uh, we're doing a lot of videos up there and we have Making the Monster by Catherine Harkup for our first October show. And that's about the science behind Frankenstein. And then wow. on October 28th, it's going to be my book. Halloween. And Frank Spottens is going to be here. And we might Yay. even get a special me special message from Lindsay Fitzharris. So please do join us. Don't miss it. Um, gosh, there's so much coming up. And then we have holiday shows. So it's really exciting. Am I going to make chicken wire ghosties? You know what? I thought about it. I didn't turn out to have. Uh, she has some very, very fun videos of people making chicken wire into ghosts. It's very cool. Okay. 
Uh, it turns out I don't have as much as I thought I did. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll see. I, I hope you guys have enjoyed the enjoyed the whole day. I hope you've enjoyed our time here together and I hope you guys will enjoy the rest of Friday. Um, <laughs> welcome to the end of the week ahead of us. I know. Weekend. Randy, Weekend. Randy, are we Weekend. gonna mention are we gonna mention deep cuts? Oh, deep cuts. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot. So uh, really exciting and important uh, bit of work here, deep cuts. So we have Kat, Kat who joins us and is from the UK. And so it's up very late when she joins us is gonna be hosting a, sh um, a class. And you can get to it here. Uh, can you put that in the actual? Yep, there we go. It's going in the uh, chat go right now. Go over to so. our uh, chat. There's the link, and you can go. And this is a live history of dissection class. You can take it live stream online. Cat is fantastic. Uh, you will greatly enjoy it. I hope you guys can um, can can take advantage of that. It looks super interesting. I'm going to try and make it myself. Um, thank you, Davey, for for mentioning that. I almost forgot. So, once again, thank you to everybody. Everyone's really happy to have uh, have been part of it yay yay, yay. peculiars thank you so much come back on again and let's talk more about fiction sometime we'd absolutely love we'd love, love to. to or if you just need you know a, a forensic consult on anything <laughs> you never know what i might get up to i mean there's people who annoy me all the time oh you mean like not as the person <laughs> i meant about that. writing not about killing people oh that yeah that's exactly what i meant as well <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank Farewell you for coming. Failures. As always, if you're weird, your family. You got the blue bottle blues when you wake up in the night.